procedures in, in our country over the last decades, several decades. So it didn't start day one. I don't want to go into that. But it's been like a virus that has gradually come to the point of almost a social epidemic. Well, more recently we've seen a lot of progress by the current administration in dealing with it. But it's a systemic issue and it's a whole of government issue. And it doesn't spare health. So health, that's an area also that we have to put on the table as one of the reasons from governance perspective that we are where we are. On the supply side, there are issues of perception of quality. Until 2012, we did not have a national quality strategy in Nigeria. Really deliberately think about improving the quality. Even after you improve access, you need to improve the quality and do it in a deliberative manner. Physical infrastructure, many of the physical infrastructures are not functional, or some are not well staffed, or where you have expert consultants, neurosurgeons, at your forensic surgeons, but they don't have the equipment to be able to really do what they are best prepared to do. The distribution of the health workforce is an issue. The productivity of the health workforce itself is an issue. We spend time in this bubble among the professionals, while the bigger issues of healthcare for Nigerians oftentimes get on the side track. Stock out of drugs, commodities, consumables, weak supply chains that are now trying to be improved, fake and substandard commodities. These are realities. I'm just trying to put them on the table to understand where we are, why we are where we are. And even the private sector that is very large, it's still comprising of very fragmented set of actors. On the demand side, I think the issue of affordability, because of how we finance health. The issue of community engagement, because trust in the system is very key for people to demand care. So when people don't trust the system, it's easy for them to be spooked when somebody says, oh, one kid pops is giving here, this is getting there. This issue of engagement of communities through respected leaders is a key element that we have not done effectively over time. And then there are the intersectoral elements. Because we know health improvement is not only from the health sector, women's education, nutrition, transportation, and availability of services themselves come together to make sure a woman survives pregnancy and childbirth or not. For a child, basic hygiene at home, water, nutrition, education of the mother, in addition to immunization and health services, get in to improve the child's chances of survival. So those are the things that I believe we have not, we have to do more in terms of uh, getting to the optimal level that we are aspiring to. So a heavily medicalized system isn't likely to reach the goals that we really want it to. And thus, the primary healthcare approach remains the only viable option for how we should proceed in terms of improving the health of Nigerians. I'll conclude by sharing with you a few thoughts on the future, on where we go. So I've shared with you how health links to economy, how it links to population. I've shared with you how the population health is today, and my own thoughts on why we are where we are. So you deserve also to hear some of the thoughts as to what, are, what is in the future for us. So as part of the group, and we'll come to that um, perhaps later, the Lancet Commission that was launched in September, we decided to look into the future on the continent. Here I will talk about, for Nigeria, what do I see looking at the crystal ball in my hands? What is the future of health in Nigeria? I will say that I think universal access to quality primary health care services is in Nigeria's future. And that that future is still bright, but it's not for granted. It does not have to happen that way. To require bold, visionary leadership, 
to drive us to that future which is bright, which is possible. And I will make a few suggestions. One, I would like to point out the intersection of health and politics. Health is a very important for families to every one of us. And yet, when it comes to political times, it doesn't feature as top agenda in people's needs from their politicians. In 2015, health wasn't very high up on either contenders, either in the federal level or most of the state, except maybe about building clinics and building infrastructure. Not from the point of view of things like quality, services, financing. But that is a political dimension. What I'm saying is that we need to demand from our political leaders more attention for health before it happens. It's no accident that President Obama made health and Obamacare the first thing in his administration. It's also no accident that even the current U.S. President picked health care as one of the first things that he was trying to do. Because it's important for the people. Here it is important for us, but we have to demand our political leaders to move. I want to say here on the stage, I know you've had a long history where that was less of an issue than many other states. But as a people, we need to really engage on this and amplify the voice of the citizens so that political leaders deal with the issues of health. Two, transparency and accountability. Without data, without really the numbers, you can't hold anybody accountable. So we need to pay attention to getting good data in order to hold people accountable at all levels. And that accountability, both in terms of citizens holding leaders accountable, leaders holding their, uh, their direct report accountable, also dealing with the issues of corruption, which, are, which is a whole of government issue. I don't want to specify just the health sector or education sector. It's a whole of government, it's a systemic approach. Rather than applying what I call the bad apples theory alone, we need to also add a bad system theory to look at really how systems encourage practices that undermine the ability of public resources to achieve their intended objectives. Thirdly, I would say revitalize our federal health institutions. Revitalize them to pro provide their regulatory functions and in fact consider streamlining some of them. Large countries like the US, Mexico that are federal or Ethiopia in Africa don't have as many of the institutions as we have in our federal health system. I think we need to look at that, where there are overlapping functions, streamline them, where governance can be more coordinated, do that, so that we have a streamlined and effective health bureaucracy at the federal level and also interface with the state in a much more stronger position uh, for the state. People, processes, mindset within those institutions. What we need? We tend to have good policies in Nigeria. I think that's not as much an issue. Everybody will agree. We have one best in terms of policies on paper. We we'll focus on execution, on results, not just the policies, but delivering them. And that requires a mindset. We tend to think mostly on the inputs. We don't think as much on the outcomes on the other side. So recently, saving one million lives for the result-based financing, which was piloted here in Congo State, was an effort to really get us to that point where we think about the ultimate results and then work backwards to get to that. So long as we only focus on how many bricks, how many buildings, how, many, how much was spent, without looking at who gets what and what quality did they get, I think we are missing something there. Then we need to increase our financing level for health. We spend about $117 per person in this country, average for health. Some spend zero, some many thousands. But for a country as this, this big, if, we, if you want to get a good health system, you need to spend, you need to, you need to pay for it. You can't want to drive a Mercedes and fund a health system like a, a, this plastic. So the level of funding for 
has this to be significantly increased. I know Ondo for a very long time has had a tradition of really credible funding of health. There are some states, including my home state, Bauchi, which the governor has been funding health. But there are many states that are not, and they need to do that. The federal budget itself for health has not been increasing commensurate with the need. In the last couple of years, we have not seen that increase. So, for us to get the health system that we need, we need to also invest in it. And investing in it is not just speaking about it, but also putting our money when it comes to the budget time. Beyond putting the money, ensuring that the money is spent well. Just more money wouldn't solve it. But more money used well will deliver the health of Nigerians need. So, that's an important element. More money for health, or more health for the money, as someone uh, would, uh, stated. Then, we need to also put people back at the center of health. That is the people's centeredness. That is primary health care. So, look at Ransom Kuti and his colleagues who designed the Almahata Declaration. People were at the very center of it. But somewhere along the way, we began to see the people more on the side. Africa, we have an opportunity to put people back at the center of health, meaning the infrastructure, the service delivery to organize it around the needs of people, families, their interests. So community engagement is key. And here, I really would like to call out our traditional leaders in this country, IPCs, for the tremendous work that over the years you have done in health. And I was Minister of Afaimo, to here in this zone, all parts of the country, I've seen the concern and also the attention that our traditional leaders have paid. In the north, where polio was the major issue, the Sultan convened a traditional leaders committee on polio and primary health care. That helped us gain the trust of the community to bring their children to be immunized. So I really want to thank the traditional leaders who have done that. Also, while I'm speaking on polio, to acknowledge that over time, we've had the fortune of having political leaders at the highest level who have been consistent even on the whole issue of polio. So, President Obasanjo did manage the 2004-2003 polio crisis. 2008, President Eradua said, that President Eradua that he would do whatever is humanly possible to get polio out of Nigeria. President Jonathan, when he came in, I was there, he said, I promise I will not hand over polio to my successor. And he did not. <laughs> now, 36 states in this country, 35 have not had detectable polio virus in more than three years. For no because of the unfortunate situation, even that has stopped. But the current president, Mr. Muhammad Buhari, when the extra step of immunizing his first grandchild and committing to do whatever is possible to ensure Nigeria is polio. So if you look back in the last 20 years, consistently our national leaders, our presidents have been really staying the course. So for us to get to the universal health coverage that we are aspiring to, I do hope that we'll have similar level of policy consistency over time because public health it's political, but it's also very non-partisan and can be supra-political. Meaning that we all have an interest in making it work. Poor public health. That's another area that we need to not neglect. It's not just about HIV, TB, malaria. It's important. We should have zero tolerance for death from the three diseases. Nigeria should put its money. Now let me just sidetrack a little bit. I know it's getting to time. But from external partners, sometimes they are puzzled. Puzzled to hear that Nigeria depends to a large extent on external financing for many of its programs. Because they know that Nigeria is a wealthy country. God has endowed this country with resources. And yet, allow external funders to dominate HIV-AIDS treatment of TB 
beauty of malaria or the vaccine space, it's impossible. People can't understand the truth. And we need to really look at that. We need to really look at that. I was thinking when we go to public health, for instance, is to say we have zero tolerance for a mother dying from childbirth, zero tolerance for anybody dying from HIV or for transmission of HIV, but also to guarantee for every Nigerian child financing of vaccines to protect them from ill health. For many years, we have subsidized the consumption of hydrocarbon fuel, good fuel subsidy for everyone. But we've not been able to subsidize and guarantee our children vaccines from our own budget over time. Government tries, but it should do a lot more. Because still, our vaccination funding is dependent on external funders. Nigeria pays only a portion. HIV treatment is also largely dependent on external funders. Now, when you look at it, the whole public health function, we're dealing today with the crisis of monkeypox. Government is dealing with it, and we have confidence that it will deal with it. But it used to be Lhasa, meningitis, measles, tomorrow. These are not, there will be occasions where public health crisis will emerge. But we need to invest in our surveillance system, through the Center for Disease Control, in our response capacity, in our laboratory infrastructure, be able to do that. And that's important. Mental health, we need to deal with it, not to neglect those of us that are suffering from ill health because of mental disease, tobacco, substance abuse. Those are all public health functions that need to be attended to. We need to integrate our approaches. We also need to look at the human resources element. I know my colleagues in the medical profession and all of us as health professionals feel passionately no one gets into the health profession for any reason other than to do good. And every day health workers from every all part of this country, they are struggling to deliver care for their patients. They are intentions, they go to bed thinking we are doing our best for our patients. But yet, we get caught in this interprofessional rivalries that becomes dysfunctional. The truth is that in the future that we see, to get there, there is no one health profession that owns that future. We need to work as a team. That's the only way we can get to that future. If we don't do that, all that I've told you about the bright future will not come to us. Private sector is out there. And medical tourism, it's a reality. Both domestic medical tourism and external medical tourism. We spend more than a billion dollars outside in medical tourism. But Almost everyone that goes out for medical tourism does not go to public facilities. In the countries they go, they go to private facilities. If you go to a country and want to use their publicly financed services, they will say you have to pay more because they are using their taxes to pay for their people. So it's the private sector, be it Dubai or India, that people go, that attracts our people. So why can't we change mindset to be able to keep some of those resources. Well, we tried. 2012, we did. But there is a long way to go in terms of unleashing the market potential of the private sector. Here, there are efforts by the Private Sector Health Alliance that I hope government will see as partner to unlock the potential of the private sector in terms of regulations, in terms of access to capital, even in terms of just general policies. There's also an effort that I know of trying to systematize the supply chain and integrate it using a market-based solution so that a platform is available that people can actually get the commodities and drugs that they need on time. Those are innovations and there are many more. But the private sector is here and we should position it such that people from other parts of West Africa can even come to Nigeria for help. Finally, I want to end up with the issue of knowledge. 
learning, research, and innovation. I was very pleasantly surprised, and very happy. In fact, I shouldn't be surprised because I know Professor Konopoil and what this university was built upon. To see the huge focus on innovation. That is the future because many of the problems that we have and that we will have in the future, we can't solve them with the tools that we currently have. And we need to think innovatively how to solve them. And some of those innovations will come outside the health sector on the market of the health sector, not in the establishment of the health sector. So harnessing them, using platforms like we have here, training health workers and leaders, not only to have depth, but to have breadth, so they are not only narrowly expert in the field, but they should have breath to communicate with other people. That is important, and that's a role that our knowledge of training institutions can play. I think I've spoken extensively. I want to conclude that from what you've heard, health is very linked economic development of any country. And the population that we have is an asset. But that asset, we need to invest in it, in its human capital. We need to ensure children survive. We need to do what we need to accelerate our demographic transition, to have a healthy population, in addition to other policies to ensure that the youthful population contributes to economic development. Health is a key part of that. And our health at this moment we can do a lot more with what we have. And some of the suggestions that I've laid out, I think, can go a long way to improve that situation. The future of health is bright, and universal access to quality primary health care services is that future. And we can get there, but it will require very bold, very visionary, determined leadership not one time, but consistently over time, like we've seen with Polio, across four administrations, presidents committing to it, not just one or two times or three times, but people building on the legacies of their predecessors. And investment in public health is really part of our national security. It's part of ensuring our national survival. Imagine if Ebola was not stopped in Lagos. When I spoke to someone who was Britain, he said the night Ebola hit Lagos, he was 10,000 miles away, but he said he couldn't sleep that night because of the implications of if that had spread to other parts of West Africa. It would just be chaos. Governance would stop. In some places, immigration people were running away. Teachers were not going to school. Military would not function. So health. It's not just, health security is not just about health. It's also part of national security. So our leadership should invest in it. We should demand that they do. And those of us that are playing it should make sure that when it's invested upon that it's done well. I want to thank you most sincerely for the honor. I want to thank you for your listening and I want to thank the university for inviting me. Thank you very much.